I would love to introduce these two. Hopefully, if you're tuning in, you already know who they are and all about them. Um, but we're very fortunate to have Jocelyn Guest and Erica Nakamura here with us. Like I said, you two are butchers extraordinaire. In our world, you are you are it butcher wise. Uh, you two started a new company in the middle of a pandemic called Butcher Girls Co. Can you tell us what Butcher Girls Co. is all about? Uh, so we started in earnest like the week after Easter. So like mm -hmm. mid-April when everything was still like very scary and very crazy. Um, Cause basically when shutdown happened, we kind of called everyone we know and we were like, are you okay? What do you need? Like, what can we bring you? Da, da, da. So we like, we're bringing people chickens and steaks and like stock and just like taking care of people like in our circle. And then, you know, we were chatting with some of our farmers and they were like, I have all of these animals now and they don't have a place to go because all the restaurants are shut down. And so there was like this kind of perfect storm of like farmers with too many animals and customers who didn't want to wait online for two hours for like slim pickings at the grocery store and us we're always kind of like itchy to like do something. Um, so we we popped up in a friend's butcher shop who had closed down and that was that was it. So we um, we curate like very like hyper customized omakase boxes as we call them. So people tell us how many people they cook for, what equipment they have, what their habits are, what their skill sets are. And we curate a weekly or bi-weekly meat delivery for them and fish which we're excited to be doing fish because we don't actually typically do fish. Kind of like virtual oh. butcher shop, if you will. Like everything's done online. So there's really no like walk-in retail type mm -hmm. service, but in a way it's so much more personal, right? Yeah, because customers will be like, hey, I got this cut and I'm confused. And we'll be like on the couch, like watching The Vow or something, like giving them a recipe. <laughs> and it's like, it's all the boundaries are kind of out the window, but it's nice to like have that connection. You Absolutely. know what I mean? So you're in New York, but you're also expanding the Butcher Girl, Butcher Girls Co. universe to the West Coast, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, I think, the first that people are going to hear about it, but we're basically taking what we're doing in New York and bringing it out to Los Angeles. Um, Cue the breaking news music. No, we don't have breaking news music, but it's breaking news. <laughs> They're going to L.A. Yeah, so you know, we um, we started hearing from the very beginning of what we were doing with Butcher Girls, just you know, from our friends out in LA, being like, "Wait, do it out here," you know, and we're like, "Ah, you guys are really far away right now," you know. But there's a way to, I think, kind of bring everybody closer in a sense. And Joss and I've been talking a lot about how we met out in LA, and it's such a big part of what brought us together. And it's just a community we love and miss a lot. So we're really excited to be able to um, really get in there, so. Chef Liz Faulkner said she'll be your first customer out in Los oh, Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. Okay, so two special announcements. Uh, the Butcher Girls have extended a discount to everybody, which is really wonderful. You do have to live in their delivery zone. So we're gonna post information later about the delivery zone, it's fairly specific. But if you are in the zone, hopefully you're all in the zone, you get the discount. Um, they're also doing a fun giveaway that will be live today on their website and will be open for, I don't know, like a week or so, right? Yeah, yeah. Mentor. Yeah. And we will share all this information on Instagram and on our website later. Okay, told you all to ask questions. We are going to jump right into it. I am very excited. Uh, the Butcher Girls don't know this. I have a terrible history in terms of making turkeys. I am the person who's always the guest on Thanksgiving, so I don't, I have not made very many turkeys. I have stood by as turkeys were deep fried and I was the one holding the fire extinguisher. Wow. And I made a turkey once and I did not fully defrost it. Wow. So yeah. it, was, it was a small turkey and it was a small gathering, but it was a total fail. So what I am very, pardon? What did you eat instead? That's a great, I don't even remember. I blocked it all. It's like eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. It was so traumatic. <laughs> I had to wipe my brain. Um, that's a really good question. Probably sides. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm always after anyway. To yeah. be completely <laughs> all right. So we're going to, so, so that's a good segue into the first thing you need to do is have a game plan. So where do we start with the game plan? 
I think first you want to really figure out how many guests you're having, right? That's kind of like the big mystery, especially this time around. We're all kind of trying to figure out, like, is it just two people? You know, um, what is it? The, the maximum you're allowed is 10. Is that, yeah. that's kind of like the law of the land at this point? Even time. a lot. Yep. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, I think you want to think about that more than anything. And the biggest rule of thumb is that it's a pound per person with leftovers. And I know that that sounds kind of crazy. I think a lot of people anticipate wanting a way bigger bird than they actually need. Like my mother fully always panics. It's usually six of us. And until I started insisting on bringing the bird every year, she would get a 24 pound bird. <laughs> How does she have an oven big enough for a 24 pound bird? Yeah, she's just like used to cooking for an army. And I'm like, dude. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so pound per person, work. and you'll still have leftovers with a pound per person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like a good amount of leftovers to like do a soup, do some moist makers, and then not be sick of it. Okay. In case any of you are like, what's a moist maker? We'll get to that. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Okay, that's okay. We'll get to that at the end. You didn't give away anything. You'll get to that at the end of the show. Okay, so you want to plan the size of your bird. How do you select the right turkey? You know, I think that that's another big question, right? You get a heritage bird, in which case there's a variety of breeds that you can choose from. I think the most common ones are going to be like your Rhode Island red, right? Or mm -hmm. what's another one that you like? I only know that one. Oh, really? Yeah. Mostly. Are they from Rhode Island? I mean, this is a dumb question. Are the Rhode Island Reds from Rhode Island? You know, I think they probably originated there. Um, That's where I originated. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah you know. But I mean, when you think about like, like settlers in America and how that went, like these are kind of the things that you think about. Um, but so when you, if you go for a heritage bird, that means bigger legs, so more dark meat, yeah. smaller breasts, so less white meat. So you have to think about your audience. Like if you have like a bunch of kids or a bunch of picky people, you might want to get what's called a broad-breasted white, which mm -hmm. is a little bit more of like a classically shaped turkey. So like larger breasts, so more white meat, but also those can mm -hmm. still be raised super well. Um, like we work a lot with our chicken farmer at Snowdance Farms yeah. uh, in the Catskills and he raises a broad-breasted white. So it's like a classic turkey, but they're all outside eating whatever you know, narrowly escaping bears until, <laughs> until it's time, so. Well, and a lot of these birds, when you're, they're raised correctly, they actually fly, you know? Like they're I, scary. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy. I'm, we all want properly raised turkeys, which begs the question, how do you find these turkeys? I mean, obviously, if, if you live in, in the Butcher Girls delivery zone, you can order your turkey through them. But if you're somewhere else in the country, you obviously can't walk into your average supermarket and find a heritage bird? You know, I think we obviously, and I think you probably agree, you always wanna shop as small as you can, support the little guys. So if you have any sort of like more local sort of meat counter, or butcher yeah. shop, anything like that, that's always a really good plan. Yeah. Um, there's also some really good delivery, uh, like, you know, through the mail, which is a normal thing, I guess. Um, <laughs> Mail order. Which like, yeah. obviously that comes with like a certain carbon footprint, which you need to be okay with. But um, like Heritage sells a really beautiful bird from Kansas that's delicious. There's the Kelly bronze turkey that everybody really likes. Get like a little Kelly bronze thermometer, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, I think just, just dig a little bit. We can also give you a list of-, of Oh, awesome that's a great idea. We can share like some. Too. Yeah. We can share some other resources. So like I mentioned, we'll be doing a recap on cherrybomb.com on the uh, Turkey Hotline page. So, so we'll add resources to that. Okay, so you've got your bird. Next, I'm gonna say you need to figure out the cooking implements you need, right? All, right. all, your, all, your, all the stuff. What's all the stuff that you need to properly cook? So let's see, first of all, if you don't have an oven, you might have to fry a turkey, right? Like there are a lot of ways to think about it. Or right. like- You might have to order a turkey, a pre-cooked turkey. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. We were talking about this yesterday and I think at this moment, you already are picking your own adventure, like depending on timing, right? And right. all that stuff, like it's like, it all kind of unravels. So you have to really start planning at this very moment, right? Yeah, sure. Totally, so- you It's always good to have a plan. Yes. So oh, buy an oh. oven. Yeah. One. Mm -hmm. I bet you you could do it in a toaster oven. I'm not going to lie to you. And One I, of those Breville toaster ovens for sure. I'm yeah, sure yeah. that can cook a bird. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, 
you're going to need a thermometer, right? You're going to need to make sure that you are considering whether you're going to brine or not, whether you're going to like, what, when are you going to even get this turkey, right? So like, if okay. you were going to wet brine, you need it a couple of days in advance. So let's, let's jump right into brining then. So you two, you two are divided on brining, to brine or not to brine. We both brine, but different. Oh, right, right. One's brine. wet brine and one's, so you're pro brine. Right. But it's the brining that's different. Got so it. I, I used to be very pro wet brine. I think it's still delicious. It's a great thing to do. I just never have space in my fridge because all the other crap that you're going to cook is in your fridge. So you don't really have space to brine the bird. But we had, so I actually, we got into like a She's hefty, poked some holes in my theory in the past yeah, 12 hours. Yeah. Big but. argument last night over wine. And last I think night? I totally won, I think. Um, but it's because she was like, well, where do you put the damn bird? Like if you're brining it and you don't have space in your refrigerator, then like, and it's not cold enough outside, where does it go? And my answer to that is that you take a cooler, right? That you might put beers in or whatever, but you're gonna put your bird in the cooler with your brine and some ice, close the top okay. and you're chill. Like it's totally fine. Okay. We yeah, actually, we have, we just got a question from Audrey. She said, rookie question, what does it mean to brine a bird? Oh yeah, start from the beginning. Okay, yes. so when you brine a bird, um, it's basically like a sugar and salt uh, water solution. So our basic ratio that we will post somewhere is eight liters of water, two cups of salt, one cup of sugar. And then at that point, you can kind of go crazy. Um, like we sometimes use tea for the base of it. You can put in wow. star anise, you can put in coriander, cloves, like, I was Cinnamon, joking with yeah. Erica last night that it's a good time to like go to your mother's spice cabinet where like everything is there from the 80s and just like, <laughs> yeah, empty, empty. Good joke. We don't advise the spices from the 80s, but the brining imparts flavor and tenderness, right? Yeah. Yeah. And juiciness, honestly, it really does help retain moisture. So, you know, when you're wet brining, you're literally like imparting moisture into the meat, right? Whereas okay. if you're dry brining, it actually helps. Which you dry brining is really just salting, like yeah. really aggressively the outside and the cavity, and letting it sit open for like two okay. days. How long do you have to wet brine for? Wet brining, I say like twelve to twenty-four hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you're just gonna do like a sugar and salt solution, I think the twelve hours is ample. But if you have like spices and herbs you're throwing in there, you definitely want to go a little bit longer. Well, and as you're considering when you should brine, you should think about the fact that after you pull it out, you need at least twenty-four hours in the fridge uncovered for the skin to dry out again and okay. tap up because otherwise it'll like steam itself and you won't have crispy skin. It'll be sad. Okay. And how about the dry brine? How long? I usually go like two days. Okay. Um, just really get it with some kosher salt and put in the it fridge. in the tray. Yeah. And just pop it in the fridge. So you just answered the salt question. Lindsay had asked what kind of salt, table salt, kosher salt. Yeah. I just use like the, like the diamond, um, mm -hmm. like the red box. Yep. Yep world's best salt yeah okay sorry the right. for the brine. Brine. Getting and really then un uncovered for the brine you you talked about the cooler so you cover it but for the dry brine just uncovered in the fridge out in the open okay yeah. and then you said something interesting earlier that i had never heard about but using tea in your wet brine so not only does that impart flavor but color right you had mentioned that yeah absolutely so i think like you know, it definitely gives it like a golden brown hue already. So it intensifies that beautiful brown color when it comes out of okay. the oven. But I do also think that the tea flavor, like whether it be Earl Grey tea or like Darjeeling tea or even like an oolong tea, it mm -hmm. really complements the like the turkey flavor itself. And it mm -hmm. kind of helps balance it out a little bit because some, especially like the um, the heritage birds can get a little bit cloying and like yeah. pretty intense and gamey flavor. So it really helps smell that out. I just, I love saying this tea, but the lap song Sushong, that smoky tea, I bet that would be interesting. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just came up with your plan there, Carrie Diamond. <laughs> uh, possibly. Yeah. Although we'll talk more about that later. Okay. So we've got the brining part down. Uh, you take, so tell us what you do after the brine. Do you rinse it? Do you, after the dry brine, how do you prep it? 
dry brine, you actually don't really have to rinse it. What I would do is take like a paper towel and just pat it. Don't rub it, but just pat, pat, pat all the way around. Um, you want to get all the excess moisture out, um, especially from the inside of the cavity, because that's going to affect how the cook goes. Mm -hmm. um, but all in all, you just want it to be nice and dry on the outside. You can help it along sometimes with like a hair dryer as well. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. This is a high maintenance bird. So <laughs> for the wet brine, you take it out, you rinse it. Mm -mm. No, I don't rinse. you don't have to. You, you do okay. also want to let it dry out though. So that's kind of, okay. that's the thing. So if you're wet brining, you want at least two days to get it. In know. the fridge, uncovered. Yes. Got it. Okay. A lot of rules. We're going to write. We're gonna write all these rules down for everybody. Uh, okay, so the day you're cooking your turkey, do you let it come to room temperature? Yes, yes. Okay, how I long does that usually take? How, how long does it take for you? I mean, I'll usually pull the bird out when I wake up. Okay. Just to be safe. Yeah. Cause I, I feel like things are always delayed. Like somebody, you know, like a kid is hungry or whatever. And I just want to avoid conflict at all times. <laughs> I pull it out like at seven maybe. And then I'll pop it in the oven around like 10. But that's because we usually have like lunch we eat early. Yeah, we have like it's an like, earlier thing. It's not dinner. It's like a two or three o'clock, plenty of time to digest Thanksgiving. Got it. Okay. So now we're going to talk about trussing the bird. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't know how to do. I don't know if anybody out there is good at trussing, raise your hands. Oh, we have the bird. Do we have the turkey cam? Oh, yes, yes. we do. Turkey. This is another cherry bomb first, everybody. <laughs> we have, can you hear the alarms up, the sirens outside? Sorry about that. We, this is another cherry bomb first. We have a turkey cam this year. So welcome to the turkey cam, everybody. Super high tech. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Walk us through it. How does one truss a turkey? What do you need? So first, let's talk about why you truss. And we'll we actually- talk about what's inside. Oh yeah, we'll do that too. So we actually had like a, a, along with the brining argument, we had a solid argument about whether to <laughs> truss or not to truss. And apparently we're like completely on opposite ends of It was more of an wow. Yes, it's true. Okay. Um, how, but, big is the, so, how big is the bird that you have right there? How heavy? Oh, this is about 11 and a half pounds. Okay. Yeah, and we did not brine this or anything. Um, but you know, also know that when you do brine, it brings up the weight of the bird. So okay. if you order it from your butcher shop and you're like, I want it brined, and then they charge you after they brine, it's kind of like, you know, things to think about in terms of how much you're paying price per pound, right? Okay. So, but usually, so this guy actually, I don't know if you can tell, but uh -huh. they, slice the bottom like by the tail a little bit so that the legs can tuck into it mm -hmm. um and that's that's perfectly fine it's a very common thing that happens but so then if you, you wouldn't need to trust us. you might not need to trust but i also think that it's better to because this does get pretty weak as you cook it and like okay. you know it's mostly fat so yep. um if you want it to be nice and tight i would do that okay. um so, so taking the taking the innards out yes so let's let's check out what's in the inside. So here's the the neck. Okay. Yeah. And I think that the neck is really important for like, you know, uh, your stock, right? Yeah. Um, or even even your gravy, you can definitely do that. It's okay, I got it. So I'm gonna. This is what I call like the gut bag, but okay. usually it's in there. Most people appreciate that it's there, right? So let's see. So here's the heart. It's a little bit crispy. Um. Oh. This is hard chilled. That's another thing. A lot of times you'll get your turkey and you'll be like, it's frozen, but it's actually not. It's, it's called hard chilling. So yes. it's almost frozen, but it does help really preserve it for longer. Um, you can kind of get, get move through that pretty quickly when you're thawing it out. So, so again, here's a heart. Uh, and then there's going to be a liver and then there's also going to be, let's see. Here. So one, one thing I want to say, it's definitely probably a rookie mistake uh, across the country. People forget to take the bag out of the turkey. Don't you think? I bet there are a lot of people who don't even know it's in there. So you want to take that baby out and uh, you don't want to throw it away. I mean, I know if you're watching this, you're not the kind of person who's going to be grossed out by the contents and throw it away. And, you know, I think it all comes down to respecting the bird and using all parts of the bird. 
That's absolutely true. And, you know, I mean, it's there for a reason, right? Like it's definitely going to impart more flavor. Um, we were talking about this yesterday, oh. but um, <laughs> we like to usually grind this stuff. That was Nina's food. There was ice that fell into it. <laughs> Turkey ice garnish. <laughs> okay. So the liver, here's the gizzard, right? And sometimes the gizzard actually is going to be like kind of like an electric yellow color. Okay. Um, there's like a rind that goes along the outside of it. Don't don't let that freak you out. It's actually a little like stain from stomach bile, but it's okay. really not a big deal. So I've yeah. actually had customers be like, you sold me a rotten bird. And it's like, no, <laughs> this is very normal. So yeah, but that's that. And then, so here's the you heart. You cut that away. Yes, yes. And so if, you don't have, if you don't have a mechanism for grinding it at home, do you just chop it finely? Food processor too. Oh yeah. Or Nutribullet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Totally. Okay. I'll, I'll give up. And so that that's can go into the stuffing, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but you save the neck for the stock. Correct. Yeah. You're all going to make this year. Okay. Yes, totally. So our conversation about to trust or not to trust was mm -hmm. an interesting one. And it's because, you know, well, first you would like to elevate the bird, right? So if you don't have a roasting rack, you do want to create, what is it that you do? Uh, I, I make a tinfoil worm for lack of a better huh. phrase. Okay. It takes a lot of tin foil, but you just make like a like thick enough where it won't collapse, and then make a coil so the bird can kind of sit on it, and that way the airflow mm -hmm. goes underneath it. And it you two have the best names for things: the gut bag, the tin foil worm. I love this. We're gonna <laughs> so, so your tin foil worm. Okay, and that's so it cooks evenly. So you're yeah, right. So you'll lift it up. So like, say you're gonna be cooking it in a pan with edges. Mm -hmm. This way it lifts it up so everything will brown. And then like, you know, like the oyster, for example, that we've talked about before, oh, right. that's mm -hmm. on the bottom of the bird. So that way all the air will get to it and it'll be cooked well okay. too. Right. So better airflow, right? Correct. So the and oyster, so you all you all know this. I mean, the oyster is that piece of the underside. What technically is that? It's, I like to call it the butt dimple, but it's- I don't like the muffin top, so. <laughs> That is my favorite. Every time I make a roast chicken, that is 100% my favorite part. Um, yeah. But you know, that really juicy part underneath uh, <laughs> butt dimple. We're writing that down. Tin foil worm, butt dimple, gut bag. It's here to help, guys. Great. We right. got it. Okay. So the trussing. Why does one truss? So one of the number, the, the biggest reasons I think is, you know, back in the day, we used to take our stuffing and actually put it into the inside of the bird, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't do that so much anymore because I think it adds to your cook time for sure. And if it's not fully cooked through for whatever reason, even just a little bit under, uh -huh. I think you're having a few kind of like cross-contamination issues that can come up, right? Yeah. So so no putting the stuff, no putting your stuffing inside the turkey anymore. Right. I know a lot of us grew up with our moms and our grandmothers doing that, but in the year 2020, don't do that anymore. Exactly. However, I still like to put something in there. So I usually put Miracle in there, right? So okay. a little, uh, maybe like a quarter of an onion, some carrot, um, a little chopped up celery in there, mm -hmm. some herbs also, right? You can do sage, you can do um, parsley, rosemary if you want. Um, time definitely right um, but well some grocery stores even sell like a poultry blend just get that's that. true yeah okay. make it look easier you could yeah. totally we're actually doing that this year we're selling that mm -hmm. for sure yeah um, but so then you know the unique part is like if you don't end up tying the legs together um. there's space for it to potentially fall out and now Jocelyn's argument last night was that what are you going to do like jiggle the bird while it's in the oven like it's gonna stay there right and my thing was, if you actually close it up, it develops a little steam in okay. the interior of the cavity. And that's going to allow the flavors to penetrate in the interior of the cavity. And then maybe you'll get a more flavorful bird, right? And okay. she goes, I don't know. We were, we, this was like, we weren't sure about that. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, jury's up. Okay. But you uh, do trust. Yes. Erica trusts. I always trust. Um, so let's just go. We'll... Yes. Spend disbelief and go with the trussing. As okay, so let's truss. Let's okay, trust. let's do it. So okay. um, this is kind of like, the, the way I like to think about it is that because it's a bigger bird, you can't uh -huh. quite truss it like a chicken. Okay. And with chickens, you can kind of go like a little like fast and loose and it's you can get away with it, right? With the turkey, because, uh -huh. because it's just heavier. Here, yeah, we're going to move it over here. Because it's heavier and it's kind of like just a weird shape, 
Yeah. I like to double up on a string. So that's the number one thing I'm going to do. And usually like with a chicken, you can get away with like maybe like your entire arm's length. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do three times that, but then oh. because I'm going to double it up. It's actually going to be six times. So, and I'm not going to the floor because that's the other thing that I think happens a lot. But also when you're picking twine, I think, you know, a lot of people have like red and white twine or green and white twine, like cute, like baking twine or to tie boxes. Don't use that. Okay. Um, you want to just get like hearty, thick white okay. cotton twine. And they sell it like at every grocery store. Yeah. Okay. Especially this time of year. All right. All right. So, so you're, you've got a lot of twine. Yes, definitely. More twine than you think. And then what's kind of, you know, it gets a little complicated because it can get knotted up and stuff like that so i try to keep it very organized as okay. much as possible Let's see complete For those of you who are girl scouts this might not be too complicated <laughs> true i was i was not that guy so okay so we're gonna double it up and then what i like to do is i find i like to find the middle of okay. that part right so so you're essentially going to take both ends and find the middle and create a loop. So again, so now this is kind of like quadruple. This is a magic trick, Erica. I know. <laughs> All right, hold on, hold on. Here we go. You need an assist? I want to know what's going through Jocelyn's mind. She's like, <laughs> I need to work on my, uh, my game face. <laughs> I, I was thinking that you are thinking this is why I don't trust. It, part, <laughs> partly, yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, or it's why it's good to be married to someone who is trying to do this. So, okay, I'm going to flip flip the bird. Okay, and I, I always think like it's important to like know where your There's parts the oyster, are, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here. So, here's the oyster. And when you think anyone was wondering, it's like right in here. So that's like the sacred little zone, right? Got it. Yeah. And then what I like to do though is I'm like, okay, here are the wings, here are the legs, here's the tail. Like it's just good to kind of orient yourself so that you don't get super confused down the line. And then I try to locate where the neck is. And sometimes they've actually pushed the neck further in. Uh -huh. but in the, or sometimes it's a little bit shorter and then it becomes a bit complicated to get to. So in this case, because this guy's a little bit hard chilled, as we said, it's got a little ice in there. But so I like to hook it in here. Sometimes mm -hmm. like if there's a little extra skin, it's good to kind of tie around that also. But now, so I've, you know, tucked it under the wings, right? Now you can flip the bird over and the string is going to go. That turkey cam is, is it, real good. Is it dope? Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Okay, cool. So now I'm going <laughs> to turn it around. Okay. So, so we've come like basically over the neck bone okay. underneath the wings. Right. And then we've woven it back over so that now the string is in between the breast and the leg on both sides. Yeah. So then the, here's the first knot, right? And this is a traditional butcher's knot that I do. So we're gonna go one, two. And that doubling up helps the string catch a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, see like, I didn't really do much to it, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's nice and tight. Just as is. And then I'm gonna come underneath the drumsticks on both sides. And then you kind of make like a figure eight. Okay. Right. Like that. Mm -hmm. And then now we're gonna go back. So the string's gonna live now in between the leg, the drumstick, and the thigh, like the, the crevice right in the middle. And then we're gonna feed it back over the top and flip it. So now we're up here and then I'm gonna make this another butcher's knot, right? So okay. we're gonna double up. So one, two, right? And this is when it kind of starts to feel a little like 
bondagey, but I think that this is very, very important because of how big the bird is, right? And these, this way of trusting is actually the best for like the, the bigger the bird, the better, because it really gives you a lot of security. So, so I've kind of like tied it, right? And now I'm going to extend the strings, like the ends down by the tail. And then I'm going to flip it again like that, right? And this is where you're going to end. So I'm going to do again, one, two. And then you can tie it right over the top of the legs here. I'm very or, impressed. This is not Turkey 101, people. Or you can even come underneath the legs if you want. That's just really okay. a personal choice. I think that this really kind of like tucks everything in like super, mm -hmm. super nice and tight. So we're going to go here and then you can just finish with one more knot. Like that, and you're good to go. So then, now we're all wondering what we're doing with the, the wings, right? So I like to take the wings and hyperextend them. So it's like doing That's the, part I always struggle with, the wings, when I do roast chicken. Yeah, it, it can break a little bit easy, um, yeah. but it's just kind of like okay. trying to be a little like, you don't Stephanie, have to be Stephanie's asking, will the recording be sent out later? Yes, we're gonna we're gonna share the recording with everybody. It'll probably be on YouTube, Stephanie. So cool, you cool. Can check it out there. That's that's amazing. So the idea, so you're trusting to help it cook more evenly yes. and steam a little on the inside. Okay. Yep, and it's easier to handle too. Like so, what we were saying, I like to do a victory lap with the whole bird after I've prepared it while it's resting. Like bring it and show it to your guests. And then I bring it back into the kitchen. I butcher it. That's we're going to talk thing. about the carving and the butchering in a few minutes. So, totally. yeah. so, so that, that allows me to take the cooked bird, put it on a platter for the victory lap. Whereas, you know, if you've kind of overcooked it, it can be kind of hard to handle this like big clunky thing. So yeah. the tying helps me a lot, even though Jocelyn again still thinks that, I don't know, we're going to, we're going to have a, a, a turkey off on this don't break up because of cherry bomb that would that would really we want it. That would just really make 2020 one of the worst years ever uh okay so you've trust the bird yeah. yes i just want to ask about spatchcocking before we talk about what you do with the bird because if you spatchcock a bird where you're taking out the backbone so it can cook faster and again evenly there's no trussing involved in a spatchcock jerky is there yep that's no. correct. there correct. is you trust your spatchcock jerky there's no, not, no, there's not, no, okay. Trust. no okay. trust. So no trust. trusting when you spatchcock, got right. it. And spatchcocking a bird is actually really good on the grill, which is great for like a socially distant okay. outdoor thing. Oh yeah, area. yeah. totally. Yeah. All right, so let's continue with the trust bird. So you, you've got the trust bird, you've either got your rack or your tin foil worm. You're gonna put it in your roasting pan. Yep. Yes. Okay, what else, Tell, walk us through what happens next. So you can also like, if you haven't put your aromatics in the inside of the bird, you can also lay it around the outside, right? Yeah. Um, you can even like, if you wanted to do roasted vegetables, that's a thing that you could do in this pan as well. Mm -hmm. Although you'd have to remove them long before the bird's done. So it's just okay. kind of like added layers depending on how many moving parts you really want, right? Um, <laughs> what? I like to go in the oven at about 500 degrees. So okay. really hot, really fast at the beginning. I think maybe like 20 to 30 minutes, um, but I really keep my eye on this one. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea is to get the skin to get on the crispier side. You wanna get some of that caramelization going. And it are really you basting it? Are you putting it in with anything on it? Butter, oil? So I don't, but now you do butter under the, no. I based, but mostly as a social crutch amongst <laughs> You based with melted butter? No, I just like whatever is kind of- Oh, the it. juices. You based but with the sometimes juices. Sometimes I'll like, I'll put like some white wine or some stock in the pan with onions. Mm -hmm. To get um, it going a little bit. Yeah, and then I like to blend the onions in my gravy, which I think is really yummy because um, they get like cooked to death. But I, I am a baster. I, okay. So Jocelyn, you put it in, maybe put a little wine and stock at the bottom yeah. and base with that. Okay. And then Erica, you just put it in as is. 
I do. Although I've read that you can take like cheesecloth and soak it in melted butter and then you lay it over the bird for this portion and that can really help. I, I don't know. I haven't done it. <laughs> I tried it once. I didn't. It felt messy. Okay. Okay. Try it though. Why not? This is your year. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So you're going to cook it at 500 degrees. You said for about 20 minutes, keep an eye on it. And then you're turning it down to? I do like 220 to 200, like pretty low at that point. Okay. Really wow. Like I don't open the oven again until my probe thermometer alarm goes off, which I think, yeah, we're going to show you if we have one. We might have. I don't have one, but okay. it's outside. Uh, but get one of those probe thermometers that has the magnet on the back and stick it on your oven. Yep. Don't guess. Don't do it okay. by time, by weight. So wait, so, difference. so you turn the oven all the way down to 200 degrees yep. and then cook for how long? Yeah, but I also don't crack the oven at that point to like release all the hot air. Okay, so you don't peak 10,000 times? No, I don't. <laughs> I really, really don't. <laughs> so um, you're not cooking other things alongside the, ch the turkey then? You're not, ro <laughs> the cat wants to say hello to everybody. Say hi, Dusty. Oh, hi. All right. <laughs> Um, so you're not roasting vegetables in the same oven. You're not doing things like that. So when we have Thanksgiving, typically everybody, like we'll do the bird and everybody brings. Okay. Bird. So like when the bird comes out and you're resting it for at least 45 minutes, Mr. Bird. Yep. That's when everybody's crap goes in the oven to get heated up. Yep. And then the bird is rested. Everything's hot. Okay. Get it on the table. Got it. All right. So, but if you're basting, you're obviously opening the oven a few times. Yeah, so this, again, like I, I actually am, I've been ousted from my turkey role in the family, so I don't actually get to cook the turkey usually. Okay. It's okay, because, you know, you do a really good job. You do. Yeah. All right, so let's review one more time. Your method, Erica, 500 degrees yeah. at for about 20 minutes, then you turn the oven down to 200 degrees for how long? Uh, usually, I mean, until the the alarm goes off at about 165 to 170. And this is the thing, like we actually agreed on this one yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you like, so usually like the, the correct cooking temperature for poultry is gonna be 165 degrees. Um, a lot of times in restaurants, they'll say to actually do it for even less because there is a moment where while your bird is resting, there's residual heat that carries you over another five to 10 degrees, right? And that is absolutely a, like a true thing. However, I've noticed, especially more recently, that when I pull my turkey out at like 165, the juices aren't running clear. And mm -hmm. like, I'll cut into the leg and I'm like, oh, like it's actually kind of like rosy, right? That doesn't freak me out that much because I also know where my bird comes from, but let's be real, let's be careful, you know, enough people getting sick these days, like we need to lock it up and do the right thing. So 170-ish usually give, and, and I also don't temp in the leg, which I used to when I first started, like 12, 15 years ago cooking birds, right? Instead, I go in to the, yeah, totally. In here, you can actually like, when you put your fingers in, you can feel the ridge where your wishbone is. Okay. You're going to want to insert your thermometer just above it, above the wishbone, not in the middle, but off to the side so that your probe is not touching any bones and it's just going straight through the breast okay. towards the middle so that your probe should end somewhere in here. And that's where you want it to temp at about 170. All right. So probe thermometer, everybody, is super key. So probably if you go buy one piece of equipment after this, it's going to be a probe thermometer. Because yeah. there's nothing sadder than dry turkey on your holiday, right? Yeah. yeah. There might be sadder things, but that's uh, that's on the list of sad things. Okay. So how long do you let your turkey rest for? And everybody, does everybody know what resting means? Do you two want to just explain that concept? So if you take the turkey out of the oven and carve it immediately, when you cook it, all the juices are kind of like disrupted, right? Um, they come to the surface, they, some of them drip to the pan, which is what you're basting with. Well, and imagine but, like, like when you're boiling a pot of water, sorry. No, it's fine. You know, when you boil a pot of water and it just like, like it can even overflow. Imagine that that's what's happening in the interior of the meat, right? So usually you'd want to turn off your pot and like let 
the water settle before you like pour it into a cup to drink tea or something. So exact same concept. It just takes what? Mm. Huh? No, I just never okay. judgment. No, just curious. <laughs> so, so Can what's the rest of for 45 minutes? minutes? How long? 45 minutes at least. Yeah. That's a long time to let it rest. So you have to build that into your schedule. Yes. yes. So tent it with foil. Um, it won't get cold. Don't worry. It'll be fine. It's a big bird. Um, but yeah. Crispy. If you tent it, does it steam the skin? It shouldn't. Okay. It, but what you can do alternately is after you carve it, what I'll do sometimes, or like before you get to the breast, you can rip off the whole skin on the top of the bird, put it on like a uh, silk hat. No, like a roasting rack. Okay. Um, or you know what I mean? Like a, yep. a grate. Put it back in the oven at 415. Oh, By I never thought time you're done carving your bird, you have like turkey chicharron. Okay, because the crispy skin is my, one of my, well, they're probably the oyster then skin. So, okay. So you're letting it rest. Let's jump ahead. I, I don't know if we need to spatchcock the turkey, but- uh it on our Instagram. Okay, great. Uh, I love spatchcocking. It's really, it's hard, but once you get the hang of it, it's not that um, tough. It could be a little intimidating at first. But a turkey, that, that seems like a lot of work to me, to spatchcock a turkey. The bones are thicker and heavier duty. So um, you can do it, use scissors. Scissors will make your life easier, but we'll put up like a little demo or something. Yeah. Or ask your butcher if you're buying your turkey from a, a good yeah, butcher. Totally. But doesn't yeah. that cut down your cooking time considerably? Yeah, for so? sure. It'll give you better skin and a yeah. faster cook. Okay. And do you need a bigger, a much bigger pan? For that because the turkey yeah, you will because it'll splay out which is i think why doing it on the grill is really cool too because you can just like take up your whole grill grate skin down and then flip it and then uh -huh. it can bruise okay all right let's jump ahead to stuffing because i know you two are very particular about stuffing oh yeah you mean what we put in the bird or what kind of stuffing we make uh what do you mean what you put in the bird like what I stuff in the bird or the kind of like- oh. well, Do you do bird. something different than Erica? No, I just okay. didn't understand the question. Well, you also don't tie it. So like you have <laughs> the aromatics poking out. Yeah. So when it comes to your, your bread-based stuffing- Here we go, okay. What, tell us your stuffing secrets. So I, uh, I do a cornbread-based yeah. stuffing because I'm from Virginia. My mother's from Alabama, my dad's from Georgia. So um, I think the key to cornbread for me personally is to, um, before you put it in your pan, in your cast iron, you put uh, melted lard in there so that when you pour your batter in, it like sizzles and creates a nice crust. Okay. Um, so I make a big round of cornbread the day before, um, just cause it's something that if it dries out a little bit, it's not a big deal. Um, and then I do like an Italian sausage, sun-dried tomato, parsley, time chicken mm -hmm. stock situation it's awesome it's so yeah, good, amazing. i think Can you publish that recipe anywhere uh, i could <laughs> my mom like stole it from our neighbor in the 80s and now it's like family <laughs> well, the, the sun -dried <laughs> tomato was a dead giveaway as to the decade that that's from yes, um, exactly. you know what, if, for those of uh those of you out there let us know in the comments and in the chat um what your family stuffing is because okay. it's so personal to everybody Oh, for yeah. Sure. People are like, like, what was your, again, it, poor Erica has to just deal with all of my family traditions. What was your <laughs> stuff before? Well, you have to also remember, I grew up in Japan. So, you know, it was like, we oh, were yeah. super lucky if we found a turkey. My mm -hmm. mom would literally come like dancing home with this like really rock solid like frozen thing. Like shipped in from God knows Yeah, where. <laughs> totally, totally. And then she'd invite like everybody and anyone she could like convince to come over. Mm -hmm. um, but and she did also stuff the stuffing into the bird. And that, like, that's a very specific thing. I think we probably all have some weird, you know. My mother and I argue about, about it every year. She always wants it stuffed and I refuse. Totally, totally. It was a big fight last year. Um, but I, so I like to take the gizzards, you know, the, the interior of the gut bag other than the neck mm -hmm. and chop it all up. And you sweat it out with some onions, uh, onions, garlic, uh, thyme. I deglaze with a little bit of like Madeira. That's really nice. Or like red wine is fine too. Red wine, white wine, doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, that's again, choose your own adventure. And then I add 
cornbread or sourdough, like dried up sourdough is kind of really great, especially like I do a lot of bread baking. Uh -huh. um, so there's a lot of like random bread parts lying around. So it's a great way to use that up. Um, but, you know, along with the stock, it kind of just absorbs a lot of that really delicious flavor. It goes in a pan. I do a little breadcrumb on top sometimes, but then just, yeah. Like that sounds so good. Donna right. said that her family does Chinese sausage and sticky rice as their oh, something. Yeah. Donna, we might need that recipe too. That sounds, that sounds good. I, yeah, let Donna know we just started making lap chong if she needs us to. Okay. Know. Okay. All right. The next thing we need to talk about. So you've got stuffing. We'll we'll talk about gravy in a minute. Um, the butchering and the carving, because this yeah. is so important. Um, you do your victory lap once yeah. you your turkey is ready. You do not carve table side. Don't do it. Or on the table. It's not worth it. It's such a mess. You think it's gonna be cute, it's not cute. And then people are like heckling or like stealing, like taking yeah. it, like it's just like, dude, just, uh, you know? Like, let yeah, me do it. It's pressure. Yeah, and also yes. if you carve in the kitchen, as you, you know, get your whole carcass and your thigh bone and whatever, whatever, you have a stock pot on the stove you, can you just, pitch all your bones in there as you go. Maybe you take the roasted veg that you cooked with it or like mm -hmm. scraps that you have left over, like parsley mm -hmm. skin and onion skin and whatever. And all that goes into the pot. And then you can start your stock before you sit down to dinner. So you have even shipped your stock pot ahead of time, right? Yes. Okay. I, I have been known to order a stock pot and have it sent to where I'm going. <laughs> Stock is key because you don't want to waste all those beautiful bones from this beautiful bird. Yeah. Throw them in the garbage. That's a total no-no. Um, so I interviewed Ina Garten for Radio Cherry Bomb a few weeks ago, and Ina agrees with you. She says no carving at the table. Bad yeah. idea. If Ina says it, I mean, who cares what we say? But if she says it, do it. Well, and if I'm carving um, in the kitchen and no one's around, you better trust that I would have already eaten both oysters. Like, <laughs> you don't even know that it's missing. Cause like, um, I don't think that my family actually knows that it exists. It's like a myth. Cause like. Now some people break out what's the one time of year they break out, break out the like motorized knife to do the carving. <laughs> my grandpa um, move. Yeah, it's a serious grandpa move. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's necessary. It's true. Well, and, and the thing is, like, if you're doing table side, there's a special way to do it, right? Like, you're going to make an incision, or you'll right. take both of your legs off, and then you'll make an incision on the side, and then you kind of slice this way, right? But you actually lose a lot of meat that way. So, yeah. you know, when you do it... It's more delicious stuff, right? Yeah, when you do it in the kitchen, you're just, like, literally, you're going to rip off the legs, then you'll come down on both sides of the, the keel mm -hmm. bone, mm -hmm. and you'll remove the breasts, right? And then you just slice everything just separately, and then you can make a beautiful arrangement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some herbs. And like, say you're gonna do the turkey chicharron thing, you don't wanna be ripping off a whole sheet of oh, skin yeah. in right. front of your loved ones. No, I'm all in favor of the carving in the kitchen. That is a good new tradition to start if that's not your family tradition. Let's talk gravy. Cause yeah. like stuffing gravy is super personal. So you've got your turkey with all these amazing drippings. Mm -hmm. but do with everything that's left in the pan. What do you do? Should I? Well, I mean, what what I do is I I pull out those onions that I keep in there and mm -hmm. I put those in a Vitamix. Mm -hmm. Um, and I put like maybe like half a quart of stock in there and I just blend it till it's smooth. And then you take all those fat drippings, dump them in whatever stovetop pan you have. Mm -hmm. Um, and you want to make sure to get all your brown bits, mm -hmm. right? And so with that fat, you want to then add flour, right? To make your roux so your gravy's nice and thick. We actually sell roux balls so that people don't have to yeah. worry about it. You just like- I never even heard that term, a roux ball. I think I invented it like six years ago. Yeah, I made like roux balls and steak bombs, which are like compound oh. butter. Like they, it's like a bath bomb, but you put it on your steak. Ball. I love it. All right. Donna's asking, when do you make the gravy? She's always stressed out either by the time or making Gravy. Make it a little resting. Yeah. I think that's fine. And if you make it ahead of time, you get it to the consistency mm -hmm. you want to. Put some um, saran wrap on it, like push it into the gravy. You know what I mean? Like you oh, yeah. would with like a pudding or whatever so a skin doesn't form. Yeah. And then you can just reheat it super quick, put it in your gravy boat, you're good to go. Okay. But I think the key is just to not be distracted, have a whisk, 
trust that if it gets too thick or too thin, like you either cook it longer, or you add more flour, like okay. you're not gonna mess it up. Just stick with it, add salt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Erica, you're down with this. Do you have a special gravy? I'm, I'm mostly down with that. So I <laughs> I do like to deglaze. So usually like, a, you know, you could go cognac or Madeira. It, it depends on like your theme for like the, the booze of choice, right? For that moment. Um, but so I'll deglaze with that first because you're going to get all the like crispy bits on the bottom. So you get that up. Um, I do like to add butter, man. I love butter so much. Oh, I um, finish with butter. Yeah, no, totally. Because so, I like, think it makes it like glossier and richer. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. So I have a rookie question. If you're in a situation where you have to buy one of those aluminum pans from the supermarket to cook your turkey in, mm -hmm. can you put that on the stovetop and deglaze? You know, okay. you can, but people get weird about heating aluminum up to a certain temperature. Yeah. Um, and that's that's something to think about, right? Just get like a wooden spoon or like a little like bench scraper or something. You can mm -hmm. probably get it up. But okay. also, that's also why like when you deglaze either with a stock or with booze, that you can scrape some of that up and then you can pour that into a pot and finish your entire process in a pot. Got it. Okay. It's just but aluminum, I think aluminum foil roasting beds are not the worst. It makes life a lot easier after dinner too, I think. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to leftovers. All right. Yeah. That's kind of my favorite part, the leftovers. So we already know you two have got the stock pot boiling by the time everybody sits down. Yep. What, what do you do the next day with all the leftovers? <sighs> well, I, so we've talked a lot about making ramen. That's a big thing. Um, well, turkey ramen, yum. Yeah, totally. I mean, or like udon, right? Like it's, you're essentially creating a bone broth. So you can take that and dress it up or down however way you like. Mm -hmm. um, and then just some noodles in there. You could also even like put, you know, garnish it with like a few of the leftovers, maybe not stuffing, but a lot of the other stuff will go pretty well. That's a good thing to do. I yeah, don't need stuffing in my ramen. <laughs> I, um, we've made, I made once. It went pretty well. Stuffing waffles, which were pretty oh, good. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Um, just putting that sucker on a waffle iron. It's kind of Why? weird, crazy. It's really good. Um, also, I like to do a turkey pot pie, which I know is yeah. not reinventing the wheel, but you can use up all your roasted veggies. Like if you have any potatoes, you can make it more like a shepherd's pie if you have leftover mashed potatoes. Or even like leftover crust. Like if you have yeah. dough from your pies that's leftover, you can roll it back out. Because my goal is to eat it all as quickly as possible and get it out of the house. <laughs> Whatever, whatever makes that happen. And then there's always sandwiches, right? Like, yeah. Now this I is love a leftover turkey sandwich. That's what's your bread of choice? Martin's potato roll. Oh, oh. I'm a pumpernickel. Oh, okay, okay. I don't know why. Yeah, totally. But but in, in the friends theme, we should definitely address the moist maker, which we did talk about earlier. Yes. So if you heard our conversation with Alexandra uh, earlier our Friendsgiving expert, she referenced the Friends episode that kicked off all things Friendsgiving. And there was a famous sandwich in that episode. Want to tell us about it? So it, the sandwich actually, I think it came a couple of seasons later. Is that right? The I, Moist I Maker? Know, know. But- Friends historian here. Well, <laughs> while I was pregnant, we watched like the entire thing from start to finish. <laughs> um, but so essentially, Ross is like, Ross and Monica have this like moist maker sandwich that is like their family tradition. They're really specific about it, but he's also like very possessive and protective over it. So he's made one and he's gone back to work, right? Like on Monday or Tuesday after Thanksgiving and he's put it in his work refrigerator and he comes back for lunch and it's gone because somebody ate it and he like flips out and literally like to the point where he's lost his job. So it, it becomes like a big catalyst for other things that happen, like dramatic things that happen in Ross. What is in this famous sandwich, aside from turkey? I think it's a level, I mean, I'm sure all of you can correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it's turkey and then there's like, like a, a stuffing patty, okay. I believe. And then I think there's somehow there's like a congealed layer of gravy. Where'd the name moist maker come from? I think it's because of that, that gravy layer. Yeah. Totally. It's supposed yeah. to be like just really juicy and like kind of messy and and it's delightful. like only good the day after Thanksgiving. Like otherwise mm -hmm. it's trash. You don't even want to think about it. So yeah. yeah. My my sandwiches, so you've got your Martin's potato roll. Yes. I mean it's not that complicated. Your turkey. 
Uh, and I do love dark meat turkey, but white works with this because that's usually what's left over. Um, cranberry sauce, super yeah. key. I love to make homemade cranberry sauce. That's my jam. Stuffing, 100%. Don't even make the sandwich if there's no leftover stuffing. And then uh, I mix some mayo and a little mustard, like a little Dijon and a little mayo mixed together. But it has to be Hellman's. I, I, I just, I can't even let any other mayonnaise enter into my universe. That's funny. That sounds yeah. great. We'll make yeah. it. Yeah, that's right. And if you toast the roll, that's next level. Okay. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. So, how about you? Do you have a, aside from the moist maker, is there a sandwich that you like? So, I mean, I, I'm usually like pretty vanilla about it. Like when it comes to things like sandwiches, I'm very just like straightforward. So typically whatever bread that we have lying around, it happens to be sourdough most of the time. So we'll do that. I'll definitely toast it, especially because the more stuff goes into it, right? Like you want, I think toasting the bread helps with the structure, kind of like hold the whole thing together. What? And then, um, yeah, I mean, mayo for sure. I don't think I even do mustard because I think like the gravy really does the trick. I usually make like a knife and fork sandwich and then gravy on top at the end, kind of like a meatloaf sandwich. So I think there's a famous turkey sandwich from I think it's Brown's Hotel, maybe in Louisville, but we will look that up. But I hadn't thought about an open-faced sandwich. That seems so old school. Yeah, I mean, it's, I feel like it's very satisfying that way because sometimes when you have so many different components in a sandwich, it's just like a tectonic mm -hmm. crazy situation. So for me, just having it already on the plate, because you're gonna end up going in there with your fingers anyway, right at the end, so yeah. If anyone has any sandwich advice, you can throw it in the comments right now. So before we let you two go, um, a lot of people are talking about not doing a full turkey this year. So you two have addressed that already. You're offering a turkey leg and a turkey breast, right? Yeah, so we are doing what we call a turquetta. Mm -hmm. um, so it comes fully seasoned. Basically, you take the two sides of the breast, you don't cut the, uh, the skin in the middle and you roll it around to be a roast. Yeah. Um, which is really nice. It can feed, you know, like six people or so. Mm -hmm. um, but we season it with, um, we basically make like a green salt with sage and rosemary, salt, black pepper, mm -hmm. garlic, mm -hmm. you know, um, pequin chilies, yeah. all that stuff. And then same thing with the thigh. We're taking the thigh bone out, mm -hmm. but leaving the drumstick in because like Erica is like a drumstick person. So she like wants that moment. But then you can just slice exactly. the thigh really easily. But it's it's a nice way to like, you know, like still kind of feel festive and like make the house yeah. smell like Thanksgiving, but not have an enormous turkey amongst two people. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So a few people have already told us that they're opting not to do a whole turkey this year. So those are great solutions. Yeah. Cuts down on a lot of the work and cooking time, all of that. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. All right. Uh, what are your feelings on a turducken? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Erica yeah. and I tried to make a turducken once. <laughs> Tell everybody what a turducken is, in case they don't know. So a turducken is a is like a Frankenbird of yep. turkey, duck, and chicken. So like you have your chicken, and then you have your duck, and then you have your turkey on top of that. But usually you glove bone the turkey, right? Which is removing all the bones, but kind of like leaving it whole. So it's what you call a turkey Love sock. Bone. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So turkey sock, and then you take the duck and essentially you could do that but you don't really have to because once it's in the inside right like like it's the out it's the exterior bird that needs to stay intact but once you're inside it can kind of like hodgepodge it together um so yeah basically you can take a chicken right you can even take chicken and turn it into sausage honestly like let's be real like you can kind of cut corners but um so that goes in the middle and then you have maybe like a, a spatchcocked and fully boneless duck that you can mm -hmm. wrap around it and then you're going to have maybe a layer of stuffing and then turkey. How, kind of was it, crazy. Was this successful? No. <laughs> it, it, the poor, it poor customer that we made it for oh. was like, it's been six hours. It's still raw. I think it, then <laughs> they told me it finally temped like close to okay at, what was it, like 10 hours Like at later? Christmas? Like hashtag fail. I've never had one, so I, I, I'm just convinced it's like a mythical food thing that no one's I, really ever had. I think it's one of those things where like, if you've got the time and you don't care if it might suck, 
do it. Okay. People have but time this year, so. About it being perfect, I would just stick to the classics. If you're trying a turducken this year, please tag us on Instagram because I would love to see yeah. that. Uh, Tofurky. So, <laughs> I <laughs> Erica loves fake meat. I really do. Like, like being known. I'm such a big fan of any kind of fake meat, whether it's like good for you or not. Like that's a whole other question. But I really just, especially like like seitan and like the kind of like fake meat that kind of shreds love yeah. it so much um but yeah I think it's it's an absolutely fine way to go you know like I used to be a vegetarian for like almost 10 years and I my really, mom's a vegetarian so we always yeah. have fake meat on the table how do you spatch cock a tofurkey <laughs> probably just butterfly it out like a roulade I mean the tofurkey actually kind of comes like it has a weird shape to it right like faux bird shape but I um field roast actually makes a really wonderful uh it, it's like a uh, fake uh meat roast that and i think it comes with nice. sauce it does actually i think alex mentioned earlier she's a fan of the field roast um i just wanted to get you to laugh because these two used to be comedians i don't know if everybody out there knows that and uh, trained opera singers it's true yeah we're gonna we're gonna release release a maybe we'll do a little holiday a album video one day mariah can't Tour. We, if anybody watched the Cherry Bomb talent show, I tried mightily to get them to sing for the Cherry Bomb talent show, but the only way I could get them to participate was as judges. So <laughs> I think we had just opened out of the game. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe next year's talent show. Okay. And my last question for you is um, what is Fr Frank's giving all about? So Frank's giving is my dream. If anyone steals this idea, I will be so, so sad. Um, so it's a hot dog that you, so it's like a corn dog, right? Yeah. But instead of cornmeal coating, it's stuffing. Uh huh. There's a shadow from this turkey cam, I apologize. <laughs> um, so wait, but does then that mean you, you like mush the stuffing and then you have to form it? So you, you take your dog, you put it on the skewer, you mold your stuffing around it. Then you want to thoroughly chill it. Okay. So it's nuts, right? Um, and then you basically, you deep fry it and then you dip it in cranberry relish or you dip it in like herb mayo. It's going to be great one day. Are you Maybe. doing that this year or this is still just a concept you're working out? I always just talk about it. Okay. I've never actually done it, I but think I think it'll be great. Yeah, next year it'll be a thing. I think we were gonna maybe do it for like a, a charity event this year, but when, yeah, we were know. gonna do like a bar pop up, but you know it's twenty twenty, so. Okay. But okay. maybe I'll make it for Nina, and there will be lots of content. Well, I can't wait for the Thanksgiving <laughs> celebration. Uh, well, my last oh, I might have said that was my last question. I lied. I have one last question for the two of you. What are you most thankful for this year? Oh goodness, <sighs> you know. I have to say, I'm really thankful for my health, but I'm also really just so thankful for the two people I've, I quarantined with and uh, spent so much time with, Jocelyn and Nina. Ditto. Yeah. yeah. I'm very, yeah, I'm thankful that we have this little pod. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful for the excuse to just like sit around and stare at our kid all the time. Well, listen, I am so thankful for you two. I adore you both. And I'm so glad you're happy and healthy and that Nina is thriving yeah. right now. Um, they have a beautiful little girl who we didn't get to see, but who I adore. Uh, and I just wish you all the best for the holidays. Thanks, Thanks for having yeah. us. If anybody has any questions, don't be shy. Reach out. Sure. Thank you for all this information. So for everybody who's watching, we are going to, I know this was a lot of information to hit you with. We're going to have it on uh, cherrybomb.com. We're going to have some videos later. And you can always follow up with questions on our Instagram. You can Instagram, um, you can check out the Butcher Girls Co. Instagram. And yeah. just to repeat, you all have access to a special discount. Um, if you live in the delivery area for the Butcher Girls, um, you can access that discount. And we're going to share the information about the delivery zone. And they are expanding to Los Angeles. So stay tuned for that big announcement. There's Perfect. also a giveaway. Pardon? Yeah. Starting with turkeys. That's right. Starting with turkeys. So um, get ready. When will people be able to order turkeys in LA? Um, Monday or Tuesday, barring technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, totally. Fingers crossed. Uh, so check out their website. They're also doing a great giveaway for New York and for Los Angeles that everybody can enter. All right. Yeah. Did I miss anything? 
Uh, we're we're gonna be doing some Instagram live on Thanksgiving. Yes. Uh, old oh, school, great. butterball style. We'll be like drinking wine and cooking birds. Are so, doing? Yeah, it would be great. Yeah. I'm gonna be tuning into that. I can't wait. Well, well everybody thank you for having us. Yeah. Again, thanks to our sponsors, Kerrygold, Maple Hill Creamery, and San Pellegrino.